Up next in the 2006 third person crime games based on beloved licenses that all came to exist as a response to both the success of Grand Theft Auto and licensed games in the early to mid 2000s subgenre, is 24 The Game, a game that feels like a PS2 port of a PS3 game that doesn't exist. If you ignore the frame rate for a second, which is not easy to do, I know, this is pretty extraordinary on a technical level for the PS2. Uh, all relative, it has high poly models, smooth character animations, high res textures, post processing effects everywhere, massive levels without in level loading screens, including a large open world, which no one ever expected out of this game, uh, a generous splattering of physics objects using the Havoc physics engine because it's 2006 and physics are cool, including every character model having full ragdoll physics and corpses that don't seem to ever disappear. Police siren reflections render on every car around them, dirt flicks up into clouds when driving over grass, holes break in glass before it shatters, physics objects are weighty and collide properly even with ragdolls, uh, one office level blew me away when I discovered that every wall of every cubicle was a physics object, something completely missable, completely unnecessary, but so impressive on the PS2. Uh, 24 The Game's production values are far higher than they probably needed to be, even if it can be a bit uneven, as some areas do look far better than others. Being a licensed game from 2006 on the PS2, everyone had sort of shifted their gaze onto the new console, so it's easy to see why this flew under the radar, but one of the main reasons why 24 The Game is the way it is, why it's so weirdly impressive, is because it's a first party PS2 game. It was developed by none other than Sony themselves. Sony Computer Entertainment Cambridge were most well known for the medieval games, but on the PS2, Sony had them develop two new IPs that released in 2003, assumedly in the hope that they'd also kick off franchises. Uh, Primal and Ghost Hunter might look from the outside like bog standard entries in the PS2's library, but much like 24 The Game, they're far more impressive than their box arts might suggest. If not anything else, Sony Cambridge Studio were known at the time for their fantastic production values, and pushing the PlayStation 2's hardware. And with 24 being on top of the TV world as a mid-2000s pop culture phenomenon, you can sort of see Sony and Fox justifying the game having a relatively high budget, or at least a high budget for a game on the PS2 in its dying years. Especially off the back of IPs like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and James Bond all having hugely successful licensed games back then. In a pre-release interview, a developer even credited The Matrix and Lord of the Rings games as inspirations here, as well as Alias and 007 Everything or Nothing. Good taste. 24's third-person shooting mechanics are clearly modelled off everything or nothing. An aggressive lock-on system where you can finally adjust your aim, similar to modern Rockstar games, and a cover system so clunky you'll avoid using it. Uh, the camera can only be described as clunky too, as it wheels around on its own while you move, aiming up and down is like pushing a boulder up a hill, and whether or not you'll target an enemy standing right next to you is a coin flip. Third-person shooting mechanics hadn't quite unified until Gears of War and Uncharted took off after this, but this was by no means good by 2006 standards, and a middling critical reception reflected that. But unlike so many licensed games of that era, 24 isn't a cheap cash-in, and it can't be faulted for a lack of ambition. Now I'm not really sure it needs to be introduced, but just in case, uh, 24 was a super popular cop thriller show in the mid 2000s where time would pass in real time. So in a one hour long episode, one hour would pass in the show. 24 episodes a season, meaning each season is one day long in universe, and there are eight seasons, which means our protagonist, Jack Bauer, had eight extraordinarily bad days, or nine if you include this game, which also does take place over a 24 hour period. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the game is not in real time, taking only about 10 hours to beat. Like, it was a bit disappointing when the first hour passed in 15 minutes, like, part of me was hoping for some Majora's Mask-esque time stuff, but instead it's a very linear game where the time of day mainly indicates how close you are to finishing it. But time gimmick stuff aside, the look and feel of 24 is captured exquisitely, even if it is in a dated PS2 way. Thanks to the show's cinematographer being involved, the handheld camera aesthetic, the 
blowing out sepia yellow skies, burning down upon LA, the grimy everyday locations like train stations and rundown apartment blocks, and the frequent use of split screening even during gameplay to show things like objectives or enemies entering the room or a security camera's perspective all align perfectly with the show. And most importantly, virtually the entire cast of the show reprises their roles, and they're all at the top of their game here. No pun intended. Go away! Radford can't talk right now! This is federal agent Tony Almeida. You need to open this door and release the governor right now. Over his dead body! 24 wasn't a show about a guy just walking through corridors and mowing guys down, and while the game has plenty of that, uh, they have tried to convey the show's dynamic variety with stealth, sniping, driving, and a whole host of minigames, with all but one being mindlessly simple hacking affairs. Uh, the good one is an interrogation minigame that impresses thanks to the voice acting and direction. Sutherland is just great at yelling at people. I want answers, what's the assassination plan? You bounce between Jack doing some corridor mowing, then a cutscene, then some hacking at CTU, then another cutscene, then sneaking around as Kim, and then another cutscene, and then driving across the city within a time limit and interrogating a bad guy. It's all, it's all very uh, frantic and erratic as you constantly switch between characters, and there's a feeling that there should have been more of a focus on tightening up the mechanics than casting such a wide net. The sheer amount of different gameplay styles is hard to list, like, there are sequences with dialogue options, there's on-foot chases, there's dragging bodies around, there's a turret section, you can command your companions around a bit, you can yell out at enemies after injuring them to try and make them surrender. There's just a lot of stuff. None of it is particularly polished or worth digging below the surface level on. Like, looking at each mechanic at their most basic level, they're uninspired at best and clunky at worst. But there's often flourishes of fun and interesting game design that sprouts through despite this. Uh, the first time I played this game years ago, I completely missed the first vehicle that it lets you drive because I just sort of walked straight past it. At the time, I had no idea that driving was even in the game. So color me surprised on this playthrough when I saw the vehicle, wondered if I could control it, hopped in, and off I went. Uh, no objective marker telling me to use it, no tutorial pop-up, no need to use it to beat the level, just a delightful moment of realization and discovery. Uh, shortly after, there's a puzzle where you need to get through a gate, and the solution is to hop in a nearby car and mow it down, which again is a fun realization to have. Stealth sections in non-stealth games can be disastrous, but here they're surprisingly quite elegant, especially with the split screening showing nearby enemies or cameras. Uh, one level has you sneaking through a lab with nice architecture, and there's a cute moment where you must slow walk past a bunch of caged monkeys where if you run too loudly or knock over a physics object, they'll all drum up and catch the attention of the guards. It's, it's these little flourishes. A particularly memorable stealth mission sees a villain command Jack Bauer around using an earpiece, a villain that's holding Jack's daughter Kim as hostage. It's a very 24 setup, like Jack has to go rogue and infiltrate a government building at this bad guy's mercy, and where you might expect this to be a typical sneaking around knocking out guards affair, when you turn up to the front desk, the receptionist assumes Jack is someone he's not, who's arrived just in time for a tour. Uh, she gives Jack a pass to get past security, and where the mission could have transitioned into the sneaky stuff then and there, instead, sure enough, you actually find yourself joining the tour, complete with a guide where it's all about dropping in and out of the tour unnoticed. And while it's all very linear and scripted, at no point does it set up that you'll be joining the tour guide. Like, you don't know what you're getting into. You, you just sort of know that you have to get into the government agency somehow, you know that Jack doesn't have time to plan his approach, and when it surprises you with the tour, it's a fantastic reflection of Bauer's improvisation skills established in the show, and a far more refreshing take on the stealth mission. Another example of a could-be-bland mission turned interesting sees Jack's companion Tony Almeida shoot his way through some back alleys. It, it sounds bog-standard enough, but a split-screen perspective from a news helicopter films you making your way through the level from above, as a newsreader yells out the scenes in real time, doing a great job too, in line with the quality voice acting. 
Okay, we've now just spotted what appears to be someone, possibly a plain clothes officer, pursuing the hostage. Stay with the action as it happens, live on KCRD. If you want to get the best rating in the level, which is a thing, by the way, that lets you unlock some behind the scenes clips and models and concept art, uh, you have to try to make every enemy surrender because you're being filmed. You have to be on your best behavior because you're live on the news. I carelessly shot everyone because I'm lazy, but again, this is a novel flourish on what would be a standard level in a lesser game. On the occasion that you are doing a simple minigame, or if a level is standard or bland, Kim sneaking through the vents out of CTU comes to mind, uh, once you're in the rhythm of things, you always know that a more imaginative level or an exciting interrogation is just around the corner. They help string you through. Add on to that the enormously impressive open world sections that let you walk on foot and hijack any car across a huge map, each of which have drastically different handling, and these really help string you along too. Uh, making your way through the 24 hours, you get to see the city transform from dawn to day to dusk to night, starting with the harsh LA sun and ending with glowing street lamps and tail lights. Late in the game, an earthquake hits LA and the streets are torn up and buildings destroyed with explosions going off everywhere. It's just great and no punches are pulled with production value. So even though most of these missions are simple driving affairs that are a bit slower than you'd want and the frame rate isn't the best as usual and the AI that chases you is terrible, they still manage to be super enjoyable despite that. Uh, they get a lot more right than they do wrong. So underneath its mechanically sloppy and uneven exterior, this gameplay is at times compelling in inventive and impressive ways. But what really holds this game together is the storytelling and pace. Uh, a lot of critical reviews at the time reduced 24 the game to two halves, cutscenes and gameplay, and even the most scathing reviews only had praise for the cutscenes. The following takes place between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. It's like watching a 2006 PS2 pre-rendered version of the show. The direction is like for like, as is the camera work, dialogue and sound effects. The whooshing noise when split screening is as corny as ever. The digital ticking clock hits at all the right moments. The cutscenes are appropriately lengthy. And as a fan of the show, they're just delightful. And they do a fantastic job of justifying everything you do in the game. You, you always know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and who you're fighting, which helps a lot to draw you into this chaos so much, starting with Bauer finding out there'll be an assassination attempt on the vice president. By the time the bad guys are setting off underground bombs to cause an earthquake, you're so invested that you can almost buy how stupid raising the stakes like that actually is. It's not hard to enjoy a plot point like that being delivered with complete conviction. And sure, the writers came up with arbitrary MacGuffins over and over, but that's something you've come to accept from 24, and all the characters here act in strictly logical ways, responding realistically, or at least realistically in an action movie sense, to what's happening around them. There's a, there's a really strong internal consistency of setups and payoffs here, making it that much more rewarding to pay attention. While I'd be lying if I said this matched the addictiveness and intensity of the show, like the writing isn't quite on the same level, some parts feel a bit rushed, and I think the very nature of this being a janky polygonal PS2 game holds it back a fair bit, it's still remarkable just how addictive, intense, and immersive this actually is. It helps that it's filled with fan service. Uh, set between seasons two and three, we see how a handful of characters started work at CTU and how they met each other and we see CTU and we see the aftermath of the presidential assassination attempt from season two. We have all the tropes from the generic bureaucratic guy who's come from upstairs to try and stop Jack to Kim getting kidnapped so Jack gets blackmailed. Even stuff like the PDA as a menu or how the characters answer their mobile phones while in combat or driving, all feels very 24, as does the constant sense of urgency aided by snappy levels and lots of time limits. Generous time limits, mind you, but there's always pressure to keep moving. Don't think, do. 
Uh, once you're hooked, there's not a moment as you count down the day where it feels too slow. So ultimately, 24 The Game winds up being a fascinating example of a game where, despite the developers obviously extending themselves way too much that they couldn't execute the basics well, and despite aiming for such technical heights that they couldn't keep the frame rate down, 24 The Game's truly tight atmosphere, pace, and storytelling hold it together far better than you'd expect. Like sure it gets basic things like shooting mechanics pretty wrong, which you have to stomach while playing, but then it nails what few games do, being one that gets you in its hooks and doesn't let go. Uh, like most games I cover really, there's a lot to look past, but there is something special underneath here, especially if you're a fan of the show. Compared to other 2006 third person crime games, etc, etc, like Sopranos or Reservoir Dogs, it's nice to enjoy one of these because it's actually both good and faithful to its source material, not because you want to see the train wreck play out in front of you. I also think this got lost in obscurity because it came out in 2006. Uh, video games and third person shooters especially were evolving so quickly around that time, and even as early as February of 2006 when this was released, it was behind the cutting edge. Uh, Metal Gear Solid did the stealth action thing better in the 90s, Everything or Nothing itself played better than this all the way back in 2003. Resident Evil 4 changed things in 05, the 360 had released a few months just before 24 the game, and Gears of War was just around the corner. It's really not hard to see why this didn't make a splash, and it's admittedly not easy to forgive its shortcomings, like that frame rate really has me wishing this came out on a better system, but I think, in hindsight, 24 The Game can be re-evaluated as a faithful and engrossing adaptation of the show, which is all it ever needed to be. And there we wrap up the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you did, I have plenty of other videos on 2006 third person crime games, some of which didn't come out in 2006. Uh, I've now done The Sopranos, The Godfather, Reservoir Dogs, Scarface, and Miami Vice on PSP, as well as 24 The Game Now. Uh, and they're all fascinating games in their own right. They're all some of like my favorite videos that I've made. So. Uh, I'll include links to those reviews in the description or in a comment or somewhere. You'll be able to find them. And uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't posted a video in a while. Uh, and you know, life gets busy, motivation goes up and down. Um, it's just one of those things. But uh, if you are thinking of joining my Patreon, also thank you to all my patrons coming up on the screen. Uh, if you are thinking of joining my Patreon, but you're concerned that I'm not making any content, um, I don't charge for the months where I don't release videos, so if that's something that you're thinking about, then take that into account when you're joining the Patreon. But uh, yeah, Patreon's linked in the description, everything's in the description. Thank you for watching as usual, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.